Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about the Ned Kelly gang and the Black Donnellys. Uh, comparison story uh, between Canada and Australia. I talked to you the other day about Ned Kelly and how Ned Kelly is pervasive in Australian culture. And you can't be there for very long without knowing about Ned Kelly. But I'm going to tell you about a little known story here in Canada that the timeline almost lines up with the Black Donnellys. So stick around. We'll be right back with that story. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Uh, Blanc is here. <coughs> Eric is here in uh, the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and he is saying that it is a beautiful 70 degrees there. Blanca is here. Thank you so much for that compliment, Blanca. And uh, how is your first uh, bit, few months of driving going? I'm so glad that we could help you with that. Wheelman's here. He's in Portugal taking his mandatory 45-minute rest period at the unload destination. Uh, Carrie's here. Uh, she's also in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul, which is St. Paul I couldn't remember yesterday. was having a brain cramp. <laughs> uh, you were right about the nickname uh, for the area. I live in Minnesota, the Twin Cities. Yes. And Minnesota also has a nickname, which I can't remember, the state of Minnesota. Every state in the U.S., for those of you who may or may not know, has a nickname. Uh, <laughs> so, Bricks for Wheels, Corey is here from uh, Manitoba, and Frederick is here from Denmark, so we have a few people here. So I'm going to get right into the stories, the two stories, uh, and sort of line those up for you, and because they're very lengthy stories. But what is, what is interesting, and the point that I sort of want you to take away from these two stories, in terms of talking about Canada and Australia, and, you know, things I talked about in previous live streams about moving to Australia, never having been to Australia before, and thinking erroneously, <laughs> very wrongly, that, um, you know, Australia was just another British colony, and that it would be very similar to Canada, and I was completely wrong. And I think these two stories, the story of Ned Kelly and the story of the Black Donnellys, uh, personifies the difference between the two countries and it's interesting you know I was looking at you know just freshening up on some of the details this morning looking at Wikipedia and if you look at the entries for the Black Donnellys on Wikipedia and you look at the entry for Ned Kelly it's 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 dead on of what I'm trying to uh, get across to you in terms of the differences between these two stories and how these two outlaw stories represent the countries from which they come. And it still perplexes me that one, uh, Ned Kelly became a national hero. And as they wrote, uh, one author wrote, uh, you know, it, it's not whether you, you know, you love and identify with Ned Kelly or that you hate Ned Kelly and think that he was a complete outlaw and deserved to be hanged. It's the fact that everybody in Australia and everybody more or less internationally knows who Ned Kelly is. And there have been movies made about Ned Kelly. There's Heath Ledger, one starring Heath Ledger. There's another movie as well, which I haven't seen, but it's an older movie as well. Nothing, <laughs> nothing has been written about the Black Donnellys outside of amateur historians. And probably the most famous of the amateur historians was Ray Fazeka. Uh, 1958 wrote the story of the Black Donnellys, but it's painful to read because there is simply no analysis of the story. It's simply a reiteration of facts. They did this, they did that, they went here, they went there. And I'm not dis uh, discrediting what amateur historians do. They work very hard, they put together a lot of facts and whatnot. But unfortunately, it misses the analysis. And one of the things about professional historians that they're always trying to do, and you know, this is the same with traffic safety. You're always trying to figure out why. Why, why, why? What motivates the historical actor to do certain things? What motivates drivers to look at their phone while they're driving? What motivates drivers to be distracted while they're driving? What causes car crashes? Why, what are the reasons that lead to car crashes and why are car crashes so high and why do we not care at why do we not care about car crashes internationally i mean if the same thing if if people had the same 
fear of car crashes as we do of COVID-19, we would be shutting down all the highways, but we're not, right? So uh, these questions really, you know, drive my interest in history, drive my history, you know, pardon the pun, but drive my interest in history. And, you know, these two stories, the Black Donnellys and the Ned Kelly gang, really sort of pique my interest in the difference between Australia and the difference between Canada and these two British, British colonies and the different, the very different trajectories, historical trajectories that these two countries have taken, uh, you know, and, you know, there's all, there's, there's so many things that are different. And I mean, one of the things about Australia is, is down at the bottom of the world and Jeffrey Blaney, who's a, a historian from the University of Melbourne, he taught there for many years. He's, he's a renowned historian of Australian history and has written many, many books I think uh, was I, when I was at the University of Melbourne, they were saying that the, at last count he'd written 39 books. And one of them he wrote was called The Tyranny of Distance, which was talking about how far Australia was from other places in the world and how this affected Australian culture, of Australian institutions, Australian economy, and all of these factors. So it's, it's a fascinating story in terms of, you know, Australia and, uh, you know, its history, its culture, and you know history you know and australia is a, is a different place so uh that's what we're going to talk to today and just briefly like i said i'll go over the ned kelly story so uh you may or may not be familiar with the oppression of ireland up until the beginning of the 20th century by the british it was you know they were horribly horribly treated by the british and uh, uh if you want to read an interesting parody of that whole oppression by the of the of the you know uh, uh, you know, of Ireland, read um, A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift. Uh, it's written in the 18th century, and he basically offers up, he says, you know, we'll just take Irish babies and, and serve them up to the, uh, you know, the British aristocracy as a delicacy. <laughs> and, you know, it goes along for a while, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is this is possible. But then you're like, wow, that's uh, that's pretty crazy. But it's you know it's representative of the oppression that the Irish were uh, were experiencing under the British. And then of course it goes into the early 1920s with uh, Michael Collins, who led the revolution, and it was you know more or less you know the beginning of the end of British rule in Ireland. So uh, Talking of Ned Kelly and the Black Donnellys, both of these families originated from Ireland and originated in very close counties in Southern Ireland. Uh, and Ned Kelly, his dad, Red Kelly, was transported to Tasmania for being uh, prosecuted and being convicted of, of stealing animals to feed his, his family. Many uh, Australians, or many Irish people and other people in British colonies were transported to Ir to Australia, uh, you know, after the American Revolution in 1776 because Brit Britain was transporting its convicts to the United States of America until the revolution in the United States of America. And Australia then became the place to transport convicts. Uh, and transporting, they transported them there and... <laughs> They transported them there until 1850, and in 1850, Australia experienced a gold rush. Uh, and, you know, uh, the gold fields in Australia, in Victoria, in the state of Victoria, were some of the richest alluvial gold fields in the world. Essentially, alluvial means that it was right on the surface. You didn't have to pan for it. You didn't have to dig for it. You could essentially walk along, pick the grass pull the grass out of the dirt and the roots of the grass would be sparkling with gold. It was, it was that easy to find and that easy to excavate. I mean, obviously after the fields became, uh, mined over, then it was a little bit harder and you had to bring equipment and those types of things. But up until 1850 from sort of the late, uh, 18th century till 1850. Then after that, where they realized that once, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Once it was a gold rush, then it, they couldn't transport convicts there anymore. Uh, Kerry, what I do not understand is that we have had an uptick in fatal car crashes here in Minnesota in the middle of the pandemic with uh, way less cars on our roads right now. Yeah, and that's, uh, Kerry, I'll talk about that. I'll just, I'll just quickly finish up the story uh, and, and I'll address that for you. Okay. So... 
essentially the two stories coincide. They really come to a head at the end of the 1870s. Uh, there was an incident with one of the police constables that went to the Kelly house and he injured his hand, his wrist, and he claimed that Nid Kelly shot him. And what happened was is that his mother and his sister, his young baby sister, were arrested and incarcerated for three years. They were sentenced to three years in prison uh, for aiding and abetting criminals. And so Ned Kelly and his brother Dan and two other members of the gang go on, you know, they go into hiding. The police go out, the Victoria police go out to hunt them. And, eventually, and they end up killing and murdering three of the police constables in the four-party group. And, of course, then the Kelly gang is on the run for two years. The Victoria police can't find them, even though there's legislation outlawing them. And the legislation that outlaws them says that anybody can shoot them on sight. But the Kelly gang is getting all kinds of help from sympathizers and other people who believe that they are the really the Australian underdog and they are fighting uh, the you know against tyranny of an oppression of the of the ruling class. Eventually, in 1880, in, Jan in June of 1880, there's a shootout, and the Kelly gang goes to ground. Uh, spends most of the early spring making armor out of plowshares. There's a shootout with the Victoria Police. They try and derail uh, the the train on which the police come in and on uh, in uh, on, and they pull up the tracks to try and derail the train. There ends up being a shootout with the police, the Victoria police. Uh, all the members of the gang are killed except Ned Kelly. Ned Kelly is arrested. He's badly wounded. They nurse him back to health. He is tried for the murder of two of the police officers, or two of the police constables that were killed, and sentenced to death and hanged. So that's the story of Ned Kelly. The story of the Black Donnellys in Lucan, Ontario, which is interesting because I grew up in Lucan, Ontario. <laughs> As a kid, I spent my youth there. Uh, very little is known about the Black Donnellys and the story of the Black Donnellys in Lucan, Ontario, which is which is interesting. And not only that, but you know, I grew up there, and the the whole story. And and I talked to my mom about this later on. The whole story of the Black Donnellys in Lucan, Ontario, is very hush hush. Uh, you know, it's only been in the last. 10 or 15 years, I was just reading in 1995, they actually built a museum. So now there's a museum in Lucan, Ontario, uh, you know, telling the story of the Black Donnellys. And essentially the Black Donnellys, uh, William Donnelly immigrated to Canada in the 1840s during the potato famines in Ireland. And you, as you may or may not know, the potato famines uh, in Ireland were devastating because potatoes and rice are the only foods that you can survive on uh, they have all of the nutritional value that you can you can live on, right? Uh, and this is why they were so devastating to the Irish population because they didn't have anything else to fall back on. Now, if you just eat potatoes for the rest of your life or you just eat rice, uh, yes, you can uh, you know you can survive, but you're going to be malnutritioned, obviously, right? Because it's not going to give you everything that you need. So. Uh, immigrated so basically they went through the family the kids uh, you know grew up they had a large family of eight the, it started with they squatted on land in Bidolph Township which is where Lucan is located in Bidolph Township uh, they on 100 acres William Donnelly you know improved the land cleared the land cut the logs those types of things as they did at the time because it was heavily heavily wooded in the here and track and uh, so 50 of, so the Canada, you know, and this was a common uh, practice was squatting on land and then improving the land. And then, you know, the land would have be awarded to the person because they had improved it. Uh, what happened was, is that uh, there was, you know, part of the land was sold to a neighbor and the neighbor was awarded 50 acres of the 100 acres. And William Donnelly took umbrage with this, you, you know, enormous umbrage. Uh, there was a barn raising, uh, and you know all of the uh, the community came together for a barn raising. They got into Patrick Farrell, who was the neighbor who was awarded the 50 acres. They got into a fight, and William Farrell picked up a cant hook, which is a a, a tool used for rolling logs, and swung it at him and hit him in the temple. Now, interestingly enough, the one of the correlations is is that 
<laughs> William Donnelly also went into hiding for a year and they couldn't find him for a year and finally after a year turned himself in. Uh, same thing as the Nelly uh, the Ed Kelly game. They went on the run for two years and the Victoria police could not find them. So uh, finally after a year he turned himself in. Uh, he was tried, uh, convicted of the murder of his neighbor uh, and was sentenced to be hanged by the neck until dead. The, his wife uh, wrote letters to the government seeking clemency and he did, he was granted clemency and uh, William Donnelly was uh, sentenced to seven years in prison at Kingston Penitentiary. And uh, in the 1850s, if you were in prison for seven years, uh, you usually didn't survive that. Food was horrible, living conditions were awful. Uh, there were no civil rights or human rights in prison, uh, you know, and most people, and most of being in prison in the 18th, in the 19th century rather, in the mid 1850s, it was solitary confinement. Like all of it was solitary confinement. And this is why most people did not survive the seven years. He did come out after the end of seven years. Uh, in the 1870s, his sons uh, founded a stagecoach company between Exeter, London, and Lucan. And it was a rival, there was another rival stagecoach, and it was enormous rivalry between them. And there was, you know, fights in the streets in London, in London, in Lucan. Uh, there was a stagecoach crash in Burr. And all of this is documented because all of this went to the courts, and court documents are some of the best. Uh, historical documents that you can have to put history back together and uh, one of the stories with the rival coach company was that somehow the, the Donnelly's got a parcel and they were delivering it to the office of the rival coach company and they took it in and gave it to him and uh, he put it on the floor and stomped on it because he was like there's no way you're delivering parcels this is my parcel and it's not being delivered on the rival stagecoach company uh, eventually, all of this came to a head uh, when the, you know, the, the Donnellys were Protestant. Uh, there was a there was a rivalry between the Protestants and between the, the Roman Catholics uh, in Lucan and in and around the area, and the Donnellys lived out on the Roman line, and fought the, the 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 priest at the church on the Roman line, the Ro the Roman Catholic Church, created a. a peace society to try and quell some of this violence that was going on in the township and a number of people uh joined the group and then eventually what happened was there was a vigilante committee that was formed and it was kind of a splinter group uh that went out and finally uh the kind of the straw that broke the camel's back so to quote unquote uh the vigilante committee was saying that the black donnelly's burned down their neighbor's barn and again, it was going to court. The Donnellys were taken into, you know, were being hauled into court under subpoena. And uh, eventually one night in uh, 4th of February, 1880, which is the same year as the Ned Kelly incident, except, you know, and both of them happened in the winter of 1880. Uh, the Black Donnellys, the vigilante committee, marched out to the house, beat up the family uh, and burned the house and killed them in the house where they were. Unfortunately, they did not count on a witness uh, who escaped the fire after they burned the house and they were had been drinking they were drunk and uh, they walked over to the son's house which was about three miles away in Whalen's Corners and called him out to the door and then he was shot one of the one of the vigilante committee shot him with a shotgun and uh, killed him killed the brother John uh, Will Donnelly was there as well uh, they waited for three hours and uh, within three hours, uh, the vigilante committee finally got tired, got cold, and went home. Uh, it went to court. Uh, there were two trials. Uh, none of the members of the vigilante committee were convicted of the crime. Uh, the sheriff was involved. He was on the vigilante committee as well. And, you know, there's, there's some rumors around the Black Donnellys about, you know, ghosts and those types of things. But for the most part, uh, you know, it was a story that was essentially buried and it was only until the last couple of years that something actually you know there was some of the story has been uh put forward so that's the two things about canada and australia whereas one becomes a national hero and you cannot go anywhere in australia and not know about uh ned kelly whereas you come to canada i mean it's very unlikely that you're going to 
learn anything about the Black Donnellys unless you unless you know somebody who knows the story of the Black Donnellys. So interesting. Uh, epic. I uh, love your story. Speaking of the Australian outback, it can be compared to the American and Canadian Great Plains due to its being a vast flat ground. Uh, there's a slight learning curve to CBT from AT. Uh, epic. You cannot make a comparison between the Australian outback and Canadian American expansion westward. Uh, it's a very different trajectory and what happened in Australia is nothing compared to what happened in Canada. I mean, there is similar treatment of the Aboriginal people and, you know, even as awful as the Native Americans and Native Canadians have been treated uh, owing to colonization, uh, I, would, I would argue that the treatment of the Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal people it has been much, much worse. Uh, from my experience of being in New Zealand, my experience of being in Canada and the United States, I would say that Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginals are the worst drawn, you know, the, the most poorly treated people by a country. And, you know, that's just the way that I would say that. But, you know, the, the historical trajectories of Australian, of Canada and the United States cannot be compared to Australia. And uh, as well, you know, even, even Canadian expansion westward cannot be expanded. Uh, uh, compared to the United States of America. I mean, the, the story of the United States of America, you know, in terms of Native Americans, you know, they were herded onto reservations. Uh, there was basically extermination. There was just awful, awful things that were done to the Native populations in both, in all of the countries. Uh, and probably the best treated uh, Aboriginal people in the world are the um, Maori people in New Zealand. It's, you know, when I was there in Auckland, it's a real integration of the native population as opposed to these other countries in the world. Uh, yeah, Janet, I was, I was fascinated by that story when I learned about it and when I started to line up the timelines between the Black Donnellys in Canada and the Ned Kelly gang in Australia. And the other interesting thing about the two stories is, really? Thank you. <laughs> uh, the other interesting thing about the two stories is that there have been all kinds of academic texts written about uh, Ned Kelly and how he has impacted uh, Australian culture in Canada. No, uh, there is, hasn't been any text written by an academic. None of it has been, you know, the Black Donnellys is all that what we know about the Black Donnellys. Uh, is has been done by amateur historians, people who just take an interest in it and start writing about the story. So there you go. Uh, is the situation getting better in Canada with COVID-19? Uh, Wheelman, I think, I think that we're beginning to see people getting very tired of what's happening in the shutdown of the economy. I believe that there's a possibility that people, we're just going to start moving forward. People are just going to start opening businesses and those types of things again because, uh, you know, it's... I, I don't know where we just don't know whether what's happening and there's there's so much misinformation about what's going on in those types of things that we just don't know anymore so going back to I <laughs> hope back traveler 58 says such is life such as life was the last words of Ned Kelly before he was hanged on the, in the gallows and uh, the other thing I was uh, accusations that his body was dissected by medical students uh, there was there is statements that, yeah, in fact, it was dissected, even though the governor of the Melbourne jail uh, denied that statement that there was some information that, yes, in fact, they did find some uh, evidence to support that. Uh, and if you go to Melbourne, if you ever visit Melbourne, Australia, you can go to the old Melbourne jail. It's a museum now, and it's a very interesting place to go. The gallows are still there, and, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> There was a time in my life I didn't believe in ghosts, but I do now believe in ghosts. And when you go down to the gallows in the back of the jail, yeah, I truly believe in ghosts and that the ghosts still hang around that jail. The cells are very small. And, uh, excuse me. Uh, 19th century prisons. Prisons, police and prisons were were um, institutions founded in the 19th century, in the early 1830s, 1840s. Prisons at the beginning were 
basically solitary confinement. So if you were, if a prisoner was incarcerated for one year, they were essentially in solitary confinement for that whole time. They weren't allowed to see, uh, interact with other prisoners. Uh, they were subjected to hard labor. Uh, they were separated. Uh, <laughs> they even wore gloves on their hand so that they couldn't masturbate while they were in the cell. And uh, when they went into church, uh, they had church service. It was part of the, the uh, um, prison life. Uh, there were barricades between each one of the prisoners so that they couldn't see or talk to the other prisoners. Uh, they did have some sort of Morse code between prisoners and those types of things. But this went on for about 20, 30, 40 years, uh, this very much solitary confinement in 19th century prisons. And by the 1890s, uh, prison officials and government officials began to realize that this was not working, that at the end of their term, when prisoners came out of incarceration, that many of them were actually worse off than when they went into prison <laughs> and they began to abandon uh, this solitary confinement uh, model on which prisons had been founded. And uh, they began to move away from that. They began to move towards uh, uh Probation, where prisoners, you know, for good good behavior and those types of things, could be released from prison early. Uh, they began to, you know, there's some social gatherings amongst prisons prisoners and those types of things. But early early uh, renditions of the prison were very very hard on people and did not move to uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for to reform prisoners in any sense of the imagination when they came out at the end they were very bitter and very you know a lot of them had this sort of gaze uh you know uh that uh, was part and parcel of prisons so uh you know when william donnelly went to prison for seven years it was very strange that he even survived uh janet i visited a jail in dublin and was amazed there was even a separate area for women and children it was incredible to see children even went to jail for stealing a loaf of bread to eat yes and, and the other thing, uh, Janet, about women and children going to prison, that was the other thing about Ned Kelly's mom. Ned Kelly's mom got sentenced to three years incarceration, and she had a baby. The baby went to prison with her. She went to prison with the baby. And yes, and children went to jail for stealing a loaf of bread to eat. Uh, it was the same with adults. Adults went to prison. Uh, adults in uh, Ireland got transported uh, to Ireland for stealing food for their families. So, uh, you know, it was to us today, uh, most of the crimes that saw people get transported to Ireland as a convict were uh, crimes against property. So they stole usually money and food to eat because they didn't have enough, you know, their crops didn't work or they, didn't, they failed or whatnot, and they simply didn't have enough to eat. So many people got convicted of crimes uh, because they were simply stealing food to eat for their families. It was the same thing as I think uh, uh, Red Kelly, who was Ned Kelly's dad, uh, stole a, a pig and another animal or something like that. But saying all of that, Ned Kelly, who was a, an Australian outlaw, his crimes were you know, much, much more uh, significant than his dad's were. Uh, he was convicted of stealing horses. And you have to understand that before the time of the motor car, uh, stealing a horse was comparable to today to uh, Grand Theft Auto, right? Stealing an automobile. Uh, stealing a horse in the 19th century was, was absolutely the same, okay? So these, these were some of the injustices that many people saw happening in the, in the 19th century. Uh, so I just want to go back to Farron here. I missed the last stream. I celebrated my birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Farron. That's awesome. Happy birthday. That is great. Uh, did you get what you wanted for your birthday, Farron? All right. So I just wanted to go back to Carrie's comment is, is that why we have fatal car crashes here in Minnesota in the middle of the pandemic when there are less cars on the road. And uh, this has been documented well within traffic safety circles, Carrie, that, we, that you have less vehicles on the road and uh, there are higher numbers of crashes and fatalities on our roadways. And I'll tell you a story that relates to exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I said to you before I left Australia that I wanted to go to Queensland and I went to Queensland and we visited there and you know, it wasn't until I got to Queensland that I understood the barbecue culture in Australia. But the other thing that was interesting was we went down to this beach 
in Australia. The other thing that I didn't understand uh, when I was in Australia was is that there, the, Australia has the highest number of four-wheel drive vehicles per capita, okay? And in a country that doesn't get snow. <laughs> so I, I never really understood that when I was in Melbourne until I went to the beach. And when I went to the beach, I realized that you need a four-wheel drive vehicle to get out onto the beach. And to get through the soft sand until you get out near the water where the sand is wet and it's hard packed and then you can drive on it easily. But you need a four-wheel drive vehicle to drive in loose sand. And so that was the other piece that I realized. And on this beach, there were posted, there were signs with a posted speed limit. And I couldn't, for the life of me, fathom why there were speed limits on this beach. And I said to one of the natives, why, are the, why is there a posted speed limit on the beach? <laughs> the native said to me, you wouldn't believe this, but last year there were 35 people killed on the beach. What happened was is that Australians would drive down the beach, have a bonfire, drink, get drunk, and then they would race up and down the beach and they would crash into each other on a beach where there wasn't any other traffic, any other road users. And so they ended up in an attempt to try and slow down the number of crashes they were having on the beach, they implemented posted speed limits on the beach. And this goes back to what you're saying, uh, Carrie, about you know more crashes, more speeding in a time when there's a pandemic and there's less traffic on the roadways. This was documented in the 1920s. I found a newspaper article when I was doing all of my research that during inclement weather, during higher like rainstorms and those types of things, uh, there were less traffic crashes because what they surmised was, and what I believe is, is that people tend to concentrate more on their driving when, you know, traffic uh, conditions deteriorate. And it's this, you know, and it's the same thing. We know as traffic safety professionals that most crashes happen on clear roads, on, you know, in good weather, and most of the time that the person who's driving is within close proximity to home. So this. All, this is all what happens. And uh, so we know that, you know, when <laughs> there's less traffic on the road, people aren't paying attention. They're speeding uh, and they're not, they're, you know, they're having a higher number of crashes and those types of things. Uh, fair, and I wish I got what I want, but I, what I want is a $100,000 SUV. <laughs> 100,000. Uh, no, 100,000 euro SUV. <laughs> Oh come on, tell me, fair. What kind of what kind of SUV do you want? Because uh, I know what mine is. Mine is I think mine is a hundred hundred and fifty thousand dollar euro car. Mine's a Maserati. So uh, <laughs> that's that's brilliant. Uh, I didn't get my hundred thousand euro SUV. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. All right, so that's basically the story of Ned Kelly and. Uh, the Black Donnellys, uh, one here in Canada, one here, one in Australia, and you can look those up on Wikipedia and get all the information you want. Uh, heaps and heaps of books written on Ned Kelly. If you don't want to read the books on Ned Kelly, you can certainly watch the movie starring Heath Ledger. Uh, there aren't any movies with the Black Donnellys, and this is this is how ludicrous uh, the stories of Black Donnellys is. Uh, they claimed on the Wikipedia page at the bottom in the res in the resources that. Uh, the the Black Donnellys or the Donnellys. There was a New York show uh, starring Hell's Kitchen about how the Donnellys got into uh, into crime. They claimed that that was related to the Black Donnellys in Canada. And I was just like, oh come on, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, that shows you the difference between the two stories. Uh, Janet, we have the stint driving law now, and it's unreal the amount of high speeders for the past few weeks. Ridiculous. And Ottawa areas had a lot of crashes. Uh, Zara from Vancouver, how are you? Yes, uh, Janet, it's interesting, you know, you take the traffic away on the roadways. And, uh, you know, I had several incidents uh, when I was doing my dissertation in Australia and I did a chapter on crashes. Uh, you know, people in the middle of the night on uh, the St. Kilda Boulevard in Melbourne, which was a huge, wide uh, street. And, you know, people, there's no other traffic around in the middle of the night, two cars that would crash into each other. You know, just crazy stories. Uh, Carrie, surprised around here in Minnesota during a big snowstorm, we can have hundreds of crashes in a single really big snowstorm. Uh, yeah, Carrie, but it's probably less crashes than it is on a clear day because the thing about snowstorms, 
Uh, and this is the other question that you have to ask yourself about car crashes is that because there's a snowstorm, is it getting more media attention than it would if it was dry roads and, and, and clear days and there was a crash? Do those, do those traffic crashes get any media attention because it's a clear day with good traffic conditions? Or is it the fact that you get a snowstorm and then you have uh, a lot of crashes during that snowstorm? Okay. Uh, hall phase. People have been speeding a lot in the city where I, when I go for a walk. And yes, and that's what they do. They think there's no traffic on the road and they, they just go goofy and stupid. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and the other thing is, uh, I made a comment the other day, and this is very much true. This is very much another hallmark of social driving is, is that people have this herd mentality. They cannot stay away from each other. They feel that they need to be driving near each other. Uh, so... I don't know what it is about people. They have this herd mentality. They got to be close to other people and uh, they simply cannot social distance. <laughs> uh, Mercedes Benz GLE 450 SUV it can uh, bounce like a low rider. Ha ha. It's really good at cool SUV. There are a few videos with it on my channel. Uh, you're, if you're curious, I'll definitely have a look fair and that looks, that sounds really cool. Okay. Is uh, Scout coming out? I don't know. No. Are you coming? Okay, well, you're very interested. You're reading a book. Okay. Okay, you're going to keep doing your imitations that you're doing back there? What are you doing? Don't hold stuff up in your face. People can't see it. You're going to say hi? Hi. That's it? No. It's Farron's birthday. You're going to say hi to Farron? Happy, Happy birthday, birthday Farron. Can you sing it in French? No, because I don't like French. That's, oh my God. Really? Yes, I can. Okay, are you done or is that it? You're going to say something or just sit here? Because you're you're kind of being rude. What do you mean? You're wasting their time. That's what's, what I mean. Oh, we haven't done anything today really important. Well, I did clean my room up and put glitter in the drawers. Yeah? What did you do? I tried to. I made a banana smoothie too. <laughs> Eric says it's hard to social distance while driving. <laughs> I might have tried to kill someone with my shield. <laughs> That's it? And we made like, I, I'm selling my suitcases and a whole bunch of clothes to Value Village. Okay. So if you have kids, you can go to Value Village and take them. I don't think they have Value Village in the other car in the other countries. Value mm. Village is like a thrift shop here where you can donate clothes and that sort of thing, and then they sell them. So uh, Ross, I've heard several times now that some driving companies must maybe installing driver-facing cameras in trucks. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, Ross, I'll I'll talk to that about that. Okay, you guys are done. You don't no, have anything to say. Let's read this. We've got a, a responsible man adapts himself to the world, but the un reasonable man tries to adapt the world to him therefore all problems depend on the unresponsible man unreasonable man unreasonable man okay there we go wait, okay wait, wait. y'all done because i got to talk to this other thing oh carrie asked if you guys like cooking yeah i like cooking so what did you make yesterday we made you made banana bread <laughs> I made banana bread. Yeah. You have some gluten. What? Lightning. Uh, Farron says she'd like to take you on a low rider ride in a car. That would be tons of fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, you, if we might be able, if you come to Vernon after COVID nineteen. No, we're gonna go to South Africa and see Farron. We are? Yes, we are. She lives in Australia? No, she lives in South Africa. Wait, we're going to go there? South Africa. Do you know where South Africa is? No. Well, I'll no. show you on a map where Wait, it is. Wait, we're going yeah, to go we're there? We're also going to Sydney, right? To see Zimbo. We're going to go see maybe Zimbo. <laughs> Zimbo's just desserts. Right, Daddy? Right? Is that right, Daddy, that we're going to, um, we're, we're actually going to see yeah, Lady Ferrari are... in, in South Africa, Daddy? Yeah. After uh, COVID-19? Well... Maybe next, maybe next Mason, year. Mason, we are his kids. We are his kids. <laughs> yes, my kids. 
At least that's what I'm told. And that costs more. All right. Okay, y'all done? All right, I want to talk to Ross. Okay, Ross, uh, come on. Can we watch YouTube now? No, you can't. All right, uh, Ross, uh, driver facing cameras. There is going to be a lot of pushback from the driving industry uh, in terms of drivers feeling like their civil rights are being uh, violated. Uh, and we've, we've seen similar things with the COVID-19. So, um, I don't know. I just don't know how that would go over in the United States with, with, with cameras pointing in the face of drivers, especially for long haul drivers, uh, maybe for short haul drivers, regional drivers, that might be something that they could implement. But I would think that that would be incredibly difficult for long haul drivers who are, you know, peeing in bottles and those types of things. But I just, I don't know. Uh, it would be interesting to hear what Wheelman has to say about that because the restrictions for hours of service regulations in Europe are incredibly strict. And having, uh, having you know, driver facing cameras in all trucks, uh, you know, uh, here's, a, here's a, an interesting story about that. So in the United States of America, to drive a truck, you have to be drug tested. Okay, that's one of their pieces of legislation in order of driving in the states. Uh, you have to be pre-employment drug tested. You have to be, uh, you go into a pool, 50% is tested for drugs, 25% is tested for alcohol. Anytime you have safety sensitive duties uh, and uh, anytime you re return from duty and post crash, they do testing on drivers, commercial drivers in the states. They, uh, um, Chrysler, Canada tried to implement that for all of their drivers, their Canadian drivers and their American drivers. The union took Chrysler Canada to court and saying that it was a violation of civil rights within Canada and that they did not have to test Canadian drivers. Uh, the union won and they did not have to test drivers in Canada. So Canadian drivers are not, uh, are not drug tested whereas American drivers are. So having driver facing cameras in trucks may be a company policy and it may be something that drivers uh you know they consent to but bringing it in across the fate across the board uh, i would see that as being very challenging it's the same thing with the textilizer that new york tried to bring in a couple of years ago uh for those of you who may or may not know the textilizer is something similar to the breathalyzer uh, and basically what it does is it allows police to implement software on your phone that tells them whether you were texting in the immediate minutes before a crash uh, there was huge resistance to that and I haven't heard anything about the textilizer maybe tomorrow I can talk a little bit more about the textilizer but you know I just I it's tough for that to go uh, it's not way they're going to do that for commercial drivers uh, hall phase there's a debate for red light cameras for traffic lights absolutely uh, we talked about speed cameras yesterday that there's a huge resistance to that as well and Janet says yes tomorrow is definitely homeschool <laughs> of where South Africa is. Uh, uh, we're definitely gonna talk about that. Eric, I guess you make your dad's super meals quite often. <laughs> yes, Eric, uh, I tend to cook a lot. Uh, the other thing they missed last night was I made uh, rice pudding as well. It's one of those dishes that I actually make that you know it, it doesn't last very long in the house. Uh, there we go. All right, so uh, yeah, so tomorrow we'll get back to driving. We'll get away from the university stuff and the history stuff. And, uh, you know, Ned Kelly and the Black Donnellys and those types of things. So I uh, hope everybody's well, uh, staying safe. Hopefully this all starts to get back to normal by May. Uh, they start opening the test centers again and we can get back to making videos and those types of things. So have a great day. Thanks very much for joining us. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. All the best. Bye now.